classic era of cinema. It's second age after the silent spectacle. And um, this age was the birth of talking films. The first kind of films that use sound, dialogue. Um, and so that brought about new, it was a technological advance that brought about new opportunities for people to tell stories not just by through image anymore but through sound and um, but the great this was great this was a great technological advance but also this did have a negative effect uh, and for instance you could have heard that actually Charlie Chaplin because of the fact he didn't use dialogue in his films and the way he expressed himself and through his acting and through his storytelling this kind of put a hindrance on his films and eventually kind of I think for a moment he actually um, tried to play against the coming of sound and still make films in his in his um, expressive way, but eventually, you know, sound took over and that was the future of film. Also, great thing about the classic cinema era is that the birth of genres. Now, this was a period in Hollywood film mainly that. The system of Hollywood would be able to sell and produce films depending on a certain genre type, so they could appeal to certain type of audiences, and um, so the audience kind of knew what they were expecting. And they also had the star system as well, where they'd use, where they have certain personas playing certain roles, certain characters. So if you had a certain character that was always quite witty and things, they'd always have the same car, the same actor for that job. Hence the star system. So yeah, the classic cinema era brought something new to cinema, it, it brought technologically and artistically brought something new. Um, so yeah, we was just look into the films of what was happening in that era. First film I'm about to talk about in the classic era cinema is a film by Fritz Lang. Uh, it's called M, made in 1931 in Germany. And this was Fritz Lang's first film to do uh, in sound, using the dialogue, etc. And the film he made here was based on true events that happened in Germany about a serial killer that captures people's children and, you know, murders them, you know, whatever he does with them. And so Fritz Lang wanted to make a film about this. I think mainly he wanted to send a message, really. He wanted to make a, you know, a, a social piece, a little bit like... I'd say Metropolis and his other films was done, um, but with a different take on it, rather than sci-fi, more just, you know, like a thriller, like a, you know, not an everyday kind of situation that happens in, in our cities and stuff, and so yeah, he, he made this film, and I think the great thing that he was able to do was able to contribute towards what had been established in that era, even though he was in the silent era himself, and kind of adapt really, and still able to produce a good film, even though there was a technological change, he was able to adapt to that, and it's that that's quite an important skill to have in terms of filmmaking. And I guess the reason why I chose this film for the classic era is because he had a way of telling a story from not just one perspective in terms of character or even, you know, um, for the audience. It was, it kind of looked on all sides of the, the story and all sides of the, all, all the different points of view from the character's perspective in the film. And for instance, in Emmett, it doesn't just look at, you know, the cops catching a bad guy, it looked at how, the, how it affected the gangsters, it looked at how it affected the actual serial killer himself, and it kind of, it's very interesting how it looks at, the bro it's a broad spectrum of what the views of the actual situation are within the film world, but also he is still trying to send a message about don't neglect or don't, you know, just look after your children a bit more, keep them close, you know. And, um, and obviously, you know, this must have been, this must have made an impact on cinematic time of film because eventually, 20 years later, it was remade in Hollywood. Except instead of set in Berlin, it was set in America and Los Angeles, I think. So yeah, that I mean that proves to you that you know this film had a had a distinct impact on the film era. 
at that time. And um, I think Fritz Lang used the technological advance very well and still kept to his kind of traditional filmmaking of, you know, he, he was very good at portraying emotion, um, relaying messages, social messages, like the way camera angles are used and, you know, a very good camera angle uses where, you know, the guy, the serial killer gets M marked on his back so everyone knows who the murderer is and he doesn't realise until he looks in the window and it's a shop and, you know, it's, his identity is no longer hidden. And um, so there are different camera angles and different narrative structures of how to tell the story really make the film strong and I think it gives greater impact for the audience as well of how they view the story and what they think of what the serial killer is doing and you know but I really did like the fact that he you know he took into consideration how that it would affect gangsters and their you know the fact that the cops are going to be raiding more often the towns and investigating more than often the gangsters were paranoid about their underground operations getting caught out because of the murder so they were trying to look for him as well so yeah the story is a clever story and the script's written very well and the direction is great great soundtrack and everything so and um you know it's the ending's a bit off because i think a lot of people wanted him to get put away when it doesn't happen he you know, he pleads insanity and eventually it's kind of the message. The last shot just goes to show you what I think Fritz Lang was trying to do with the whole film. He was trying to send the message. And the last shot of the woman crying and, you know, the children's gone. and Just protect the children and look out for them because there is dangerous people out there. So this film kind of used the fictional elements of narration to tell a realistic story, really. I mean, true events that happened in Germany, so this was the birth of a kind of social film and I guess there was films before that, like Charlie Chaplin and stuff, but this was more of a social film to do with law rather than just how people behaved in the streets and characters. This was about seriously, you know, evil people in the world that can do harm to you and your family. So yeah, this film was an important piece in the era for its land held himself in adapting to that technological change and I think it plays a very important part in the history of film. One distinctive film of the classic era again brings out the genre and this film is Frankenstein in made in 1931 by James Whale and again this film has significance because of Again, the genre thing about the horror genre was just about being established. Um, as I said in the last episode about the Phantom of the Opera, it kind of it, it opened a door for a type of film to be produced, the horror type, if you will. And uh, Frankenstein was obviously one of the first to kind of spring out this genre in Hollywood and eventually around the world. And um, again, Frankenstein, it, it crossed borders with sci-fi and obviously fantasy in a way and I guess that's kind of what horror is. Horror is the fantasy of sci-fi going wrong um, and obviously in this again the, the, the Frankenstein the doctor invents this monster again there's that there's that recurring theme in horrors where there's always a monster there's a there's a different there's a the other and people fear that uh, or people embrace it whichever way people are, or why they look in life, and um, James Well brought a great attention to the monster, um, there's certain clips where there's a really, really, I mean it's kind of, when you look at it, it's a bit strange to watch the shot, but when Frankenstein's actually walking in the room backwards, realistically he wouldn't walk in the room backwards, but I think what he was trying to do is create a, a, a mystery with the monster, and made him turn around really slowly to sort of shock the audiences, which I, I believe in that time worked, and the shot itself kind of did have a, a sense of horror. Um, so yeah, I guess the, the genre of horror was gained from how the stories were portrayed of monsters, and these horrific events and horrific stories. And um, again, it was a talking film, and um, 
one of the famous lines that's alive, it's alive, it's quite, it's quite a strong line and it's mainly what really the whole film's about, it's about sustaining life and being able to, you know, about dealing with death and these are all, these are all subjects that kind of hor horrify the human being itself because, you know, death's the end of our time. So, and obviously times to do with science fiction. So this is where the, the sci-fi and, you know, uh, horror mix up. So, yeah, James Well used great dialogue and, and, well, the script was um, a great dialogue and a great story of how, about family history and, um, you know, how sometimes obsession can get you in the wrong place and eventually bring out a monster in, you know, from yourself, but in this case it was a monster from in another body. Not to mention the fact that his helper used the wrong brain, so it's kind of, you know, another thing that shows you that, you know, outside influences can also increase on the chance of it being horrific and, you know, changing future circumstances of whatever you're doing in life, whether it be an experiment or, you know, building a house. So, yeah, I, I think this film has great significance in the history of film. And, um, you know, it still survives today. I mean, there's probably various... It, I'm surprised there isn't more recent remakes of the Frankenstein story anyway. I mean, they keep bringing out, you know, Texas Chainsaw and things like that. So it would be, it'd be a great to see another remake due to technological advancements and other techniques in terms of special effects and makeup. So, yeah, it's, it's a, a great film of its time and very much enjoyed by myself. A different kind of film for the classic cinema in turn, compared to the horror genre is, I guess it's in the comedy genre, and the reason why I chose this is mainly because who made it, and that's the Marx Brothers, and they were known for their, their controversial filmmaking and their witty structures of story and narration, actually, to be honest. Taking, obviously, the film Duck Soup, which is the, the film I watched for, for theirs in 1933. This film holds a great premise for comedy, and it's quite theatrical, and again, it, it kind of is like an influenced version of Charlie Chaplin's work, and how they kind of had a, a typical kind of narrative structure of story and where, you know, fighting, you know, so a, an event happens that has to change and they have to resolve it and, you know, everything's back to normal and it's a happy ending. But with theirs, it's obviously the story is about um, a war that's going to happen between two nations and the, the a new leader's been appointed, which is one of the Marx brothers, and he's complete you know, all the Marx Brothers who play characters in this, they're, all their characters are not related, but they end up coming into the same situations and connected. Um, but they're all jokers, they're, they don't take anything serious, and it's all a joke to them, and everything they say is a kind of, it's a pun, it's a witty comment, it's, a, it's not serious at all. And every other character in the world that they play in, couldn't, they kind of go along with it, and they're not really sure why they're saying this, but they kind of carry on, and it's, a different, it's different. It's a different take on the narrative form in terms of Hollywood films, and um, you know, again, there's singing in it, and it kind of, again, that brings out a theatrical aspect about it uh, rather than a cinematic aspect about it. Uh, rather, again, putting on a show rather than you know showing a story. So, what this kind of, I think, established in the classic cinema is a, you know how, again, you can play around with the narrative form. It's so vast and so versatile that you can literally play around with it and still keep a kind of sense of familiarity with the narrative form, but bring something new. And they did in a funny way, and I think, you know, they're, what they did still remember today in terms of history. Uh, you know, even their gags and their, the way they do their jokes is kind of used as well in various comedy films. It's, um, it's something that works, and... When something works, it can be reused and used to a point where it will never really get unenjoyed by viewers. Um, there is obviously some circumstances where things just, you know, don't have the same effect anymore. But I believe that this type of comedy has a good effect and it does last. So yeah, Duck Soup was definitely a good film for me to analyse in terms of 
what it brought to the classic cinema and history of film. Now, the film I'm about to talk to about is kind of very important in terms of film history, not just the classic cinema, but in terms of, you know, futuristic genre films of horror, thriller, you know, all different kind of films that use a sense of thrills and mystery and, and stuff like that. And this is and mainly suspense. And this is Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, he's known as the master of suspense because he developed a technique in storytelling using cinematic devices and music and various other techniques to produce the suspense feel, uh, which is mainly found in thrillers and even sometimes now, even in comedies. Um, and that established him as an iconic director of his time and eventually in the future, which Hollywood picked up on and wanted to get hold of and use and use in their films, not just to make a profit, but to also to express how much they uh, you know, appreciate his style of filmmaking. And the film I'm going to be talking about is um, The Man Who Knew Too Much, which actually is the original one made in 1936 in England. Eventually was remade in Hollywood. Um, but yeah, this film, based around um, an act the same actor from M, actually, same villain, who Eastern Europeans, I think they're German or even they're, they're in, in Eastern European area, are in England and they kidnap the daughter of, um, of a fellow and his wife and um, obviously holding ransom for a certain amount of money and etc. And again, this is a typical kind of crime thriller. But the interesting thing is about this film, it's very Absolutely. English in terms of its culture and um, dialect in terms of its sound and the way that it's speaking. There's not, there's not much expressions. You know, they're quite, the actors in this are quite passive, mainly the man anyway. I mean, you know, which is a bit strange for a film when normally the males are quite, you know, action driven rather than passive, and normally the women are passive. But in this film, it's, it's got, it has a strange vibe to it. But it definitely gave the film world a new take on how to tell a story and captivate the audience in a way that would change, you know, history of film altogether. And this film done that very well, you, you, you know, with the vi devices of, of filmmaking. As you see in the film, you know, it's certain clips, certain sounds implicate a sense of oh, what's going to happen or oh my god you know when there's no control in what's going to happen you kind of on edge you're waiting you're in anticipation Hitchcock was one of them directors that had the ability to really show that to really get people to feel that and you know that's why he's called Master of Suspense I guess so yeah this, this film again it wasn't one of the only films that gave him that status as a director but it's what started it it's what got him to where he was in that time and where it is today in film um, all around the world, really. And, um, yeah, so this film incorporated a lot into the uh, into film's life in the classic era. The film I'm about to talk to you about now is a very important film in terms of film history in, in the future, like today. And, and then this film called Cat People, which was made in 1942 by Jacques Tourneur. Now, why I've chosen this film, mainly because I haven't seen it, and also because it's what I've established and what I've learned from this film is that in the period of time it was, it was one of the first kind of films to develop the sense of psychoanalysis. And, you know, about what relies not just in the mind, in the conscious mind, but in the subconscious mind, and how that comes out through our vocabulary, and, but also through our actions. And in this story, it's about a young fellow who, well, you know, a middle-aged fellow who falls in love with a, a, a Russian woman who is a fashion designer. But eventually, their relationship kind of ends up being on the rocks because of a fear she has of her own self. And that is that she has the fear that eventually she'll turn into a panther. 
cat-like person, which is a story she was told as a young child. And eventually this kind of disrupts the hers and the, her lover's relationship and his work friend, which is also a female, ends up becoming you know, quite concerned for him and they end up realising that they should be together. And the woman sees a psychologist and he tries to help her. Eventually he embraces what how she feels about turning into a cat and wants to experience that himself. So it's kind of an interesting story. Again, because it deals with the mind. It deals with more rather than the norm. It deals with rather than what's going on inside of us. Um, their instincts, their unconscious thoughts, then what goes on in our minds when we dream and, and how that comes out in reality. And in this case, it's obviously this woman believes that she turns into a cat, which she fears. And, and through the film, the way it's directed, it's subtly hinted that she does, and, but you never quite see her turn into one. And it's always vague. And, but that's the great thing about it is that there is a blur between what people actually believe and to be real and what's actually happening and what's actually part of being delusional and and brainwashed and tricked into believing something that's not real. And I think that the director, Jack Turner, done this, Jack S. Turner, done a great job of this. And the psychoanalysis aspect of the story, you know, it contributes to a lot of films in the, in the future after its time. Even where I read once that Christopher Nolan made quite a lot of the actors on Dark Knight watch the film just to get you know some kind of idea of what he was going for psychoanalysis wise in in the Batman series, um, and obviously that relates to you know Bruce Wayne, Christian Bale's character becoming a bat, you know, fearing something and becoming it, and except in Batman he uses it as a symbol rather than in Cat People it's more of a a fear, and obviously. You know, because of its time it was in, it was in them in that decade, it wasn't really accepted of, you know, heroes and standing up and, you know, becoming a symbol. It was rather looked down upon and everyone should be communal and getting along and nothing ever goes wrong. Well, this film kind of dealt with that in a way. It dealt with something different happening, something breaking the cycle of the norm. And this is a typical kind of narrative story. It doesn't really have plot points in the sense of what's going to happen next. It's more of a, you're just, you're more on the edge of waiting for this panther to appear out of this woman. You're waiting for her to metamorphose into this cat and, you know, scare you and really see that it's true or not. And, um, and this is one of them iconic films that established itself as a psychoanalysis film in terms of genre in noir and even horror actually and today the psychoanalysis is used in them in them different genres and in Hollywood and all over the world. So yeah this this film contributed again like many like the others I've spoke about uh, a great deal to film and you know this was one of them iconic films in the classic era that gave film something more to its being in the future and of that decade. The last film I'm going to talk to you guys about is called La Terra Tremere, which means the Earth Trembles, it's Italian, and it was made in 1948 by Luciano Visionti. Now this film, the reason why I've chosen this film for the last is because it's the first of its kind again, it brings out something new to the, to the era of film in its, in its innocence, and for me it's, it's been noted down as a you know, a docu-fiction, a realistic fictional film and in that sense it means that the whole story of this film is kind of about these fishermen in a little Sicily village in, off, um, in near Italy and, um, and how they, you know, live day by day working at night fishing and just to stay alive really so they could feed their family. Then. But it's got a nice take and it's in a sense it it is fictional, but it's shot, all shot kind of documentary-esque. It's not, you know, it's not, there's no plot points or necessarily, you know, changes in character or whatever. It's more about, you know, what 
they try to do for their own lives and we kind of follow what they're doing. We're kind of following, from the perspective, we're kind of following what their families do and how they live and eventually, you know, the sons of one particular family against, they rise up against the oppressors, the, you know, the merchants that sell the fish and they want to, you know, they want to work for themselves rather than slave away for others to benefit and eventually they do and all the characters in the film aren't actually actors, they're all non-professional, they're all amateur actors, so that gives it another realistic approach where there's no, you know, they're not actually getting inside a character, they're just being themselves and they're just, you know, reading some lines, if you will, or, and, um, but still keeping to themselves and so eventually they, you know, they rise up against them, build their own company, they start getting a lot of money from sending their own what they catch and eventually they start to make a good fortune but it all comes down and when you know it's they both get destroyed and that's because they tried they it, normally they go out at night but they try, try to go out in the day to get more so they could earn more and I guess it's portrayed as a bit greedy but also the will to do better for themselves and that's an, that's a strong trait to have as a human being. And, yeah, it's, it's, very, it's a very strong story. There's a lot of emotion in it, a lot of difficult and struggles and conflicts between characters, family, you know, outside the family as well. And then you kind of just watch a decline. There's no real happy ending, really. It's kind of a decline from them, which is another, again, I guess it's another realistic, realistic, um, structure of narration and normally within for instance Hollywood films you get a happy ending or you know the your favorite your favorite protagonist character would win or they'd be happy at the end but within this this kind of it's kind of realistic in a sense it doesn't happen like that the truth is that it does go downhill for them and they just plummet back to where they started really and the director Luciano I think he was trying to capture the realism of it to portray to give the audience an idea that, you know, realistic events in reality can be expressionistic as well, as well as fantasy, and um, using direction and different cinematic devices, sound, etc. He was able to portray this in an artistic way, but still able to keep it realistic, still able to keep it documentary-like. And, you know, it's this kind of filmmaker, I think documentary is now quite a strong kind of film-matic um, genre or even type of film today because you know real life stories do if, do kind of get to you more because they're you know we live real life, fantasy is kind of just an idea, it's, a, it's part of our imagination, it's where we, it's an escape where we want to be to get away from reality but with these stories it's kind of you're able to understand and have some sympathy or, you know, go against what what the, what the events happen or what the characters' ideas or motives and actions are. But, um, and yeah, I guess this is one of the first kind of films that spawned the realistic films, the documentary-esque fictional films where techniques in the cinematic world are used to display rather than narrative build-ups or plot change and impacts and climaxes rather than just having the camera rolling capturing reality as it is and letting what the world and what let what the world does let it unfold on the film um, and let the audience see how it actually is and this film I believe kind of using that impact of the cinematic life forever and you know films life and changed it for the better I think and films today are exploring that to no end and it's, it's, it's positive and I don't think there's much negative in it and yeah it's definitely one of them films that captures the heart of the audience and that's one of the main points about cinema is that you're trying to captivate, capture your audience in a certain state of mind or emotion to send out your message or just to make them feel good or make them feel bad or make them feel something um, to gain an effect 
and this film in its documentary s way done that very well and achieved something better with film. So, after viewing all these films and kind of displaying what their historical impact was in the life of film, what have we learned about this era and what have we tried to explore? Well, why don't we try to explore technological advancement in films, you know, the, the coming sound and how that contributed towards film or how it didn't, and also what new types of, not what new styles were coming out, what what were the directors and the main filmmakers of that era trying to explore further within the, the potential of film. And I think what they're trying to do is kind of, again, it's playing with narration, playing with forms, playing with style, playing with genres, playing with characterisation. And, and this, and the fact that these directors explored that in this era kind of was done for the better of films like for the next decade and the decades beyond and, I think that um, if you go away and watch yourselves, I think you could learn a lot in terms of how films today still kind of use them devices. I mean, if any devices they used back then work so well, I think a lot of aspiring filmmakers and filmmakers looking up to them films or learning from them films kind of still use them. But again, it's kind of adaptive. It's, it's like taking an idea, but you're displaying it in a different way. So... In a sense, but you've got to still keep, you've still got to kind of have an, a, the content of how people are going to relate to it. So the idea is still, they still understand the idea, but it's portrayed in a different way, it's presented differently. And that's kind of what a lot of arts do, is that they do use different forms, for instance, painting, music, film, you know, um, expression, even fashion, you know, computer games, all these different expressive forms of fantasy and idea or ideology it's all kind of connected on the same level of communication it's all about communicating ideas or communicating messages to another human being but through the form of imagery and sound uh, through the senses and film is able to create a 3d world a three-dimensional world but on a 2d plane but the human the way the human mind works it's going to actually using the narrative form and cinematic devices such as camera angles and transitions and sounds, it was able to kind of elude the human mind into thinking that what's happening is real and what's happening is an event they're witnessing in their life and memory. And also that could be, you know, the, the way the auditoriums were built were kind of dark and the only thing you could see was the film light, which kind of focuses the world of film even more for the human how it sees it through the, through the optics. So I think, yeah, the, the classic era was an era of establishing another way to portray an idea or story or ideology through sound rather than just imagery. I mean, you had music before, but when people are actually talking, you can, it's more of a communicative, communicational um, aesthetic rather than just having music in, a, in imagery. But, you know, the dialogue doesn't necessarily always be a good thing. It can, you know, remember there's the idea of the rather than just telling someone a story, you can show them through imagery. But dialogue today has been used in a very clever way, not just to establish story, but to establish character. And, you know, their brains, what goes on in there, in a 2D flat plane, but they're establishing through dialogue in the human mind, in the audience mind, in a three-dimensional reality. So that's that's a powerful thing to have and to portray. So yeah, um, thanks for watching. Um, I hope you've learned something really. This is kind of what it's all about. And um, if you do have any comments or any film recommendations for um, for this, the reels of time, if you think that a certain film holds a lot of impact on the history of film and how you think it contributes a lot, just message on the, the Facebook page or even on the video itself on YouTube. And I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have and check out the films really. And um, I'll see you soon, guys.